joint committee meeting between the budget and finance and uh, health hospitals and social services. Uh, we'll go ahead and continue. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started and we'll let council members uh, come in as, as their schedule permits. Um, we're here um, in light of the administration's um, announcement as it relates to uh, the proposed restructuring of, of General Hospital. Um, and as a committee, uh, we wanted to make sure that um, uh, correct information is being disseminated um, to out in the community and that all of us are on one accord as it relates to, to this proposal. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask uh, Ms. Frida Player. Um, she's here with SEIU. Um, you will be here. Hopefully your presentation will scroll as, as you're speaking. Uh, we will be on a, a tight schedule. Um, and I ask that you, you articulate uh, to the committee, uh, to the viewing audience, um, as it relates to uh, the impact that this proposal may have on uh, the constituents that your organization represents. So you can come down and you can sit in front of me and the, the microphone will be yours. Either one. Council members, we'll allow our, our, um, our presenters to provide an overview um, and then we'll take questions at the end um, and I will be limiting those due to we have our, our budget and finance committee that immediately precedes these. Um, but this will be uh, not be the only opportunity where you'll be afforded to, to, to ask questions of them. Um, we're just gonna run a, a, a tight schedule today and I apologize for that in advance. Council Lady Weiner. Thank you, I just have a point of order kind of question. Can you share with us who's gonna be speaking today in advance? Absolutely, um, we have Ms. Frida Player here uh, with SEIU. We have Sheriff Hall here with the Sheriff's Department. We'll have a representative also uh, speaking on behalf of, of finance um, to provide an, uh, an overview. We have Representative uh, Harold Love that will be providing um, information as it relates to the fiscal impact on a state level. Uh, we have uh, Bruce Namor or Don Alexander, I believe, uh, from General Hospital. And did I miss anyone else? And Dr. Webb. I don't have my contacts in, Dr. Webb. I apologize. And I've been joined by Vice Mayor David Brawley. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Ms. Player, the, the mic is yours. Good afternoon to the members of the Council. I am Frida Player Peters, and on behalf of SEIU Local 205, and we represent the Nashville General Employees. Most of the employees could not be here today to tell their story. So the pictures on the screen represent some of the employees that what your decision was, is going to affect. And there's also some who are, took time out of their day to come here out in the gallery. This restructure will affect almost 800 employees of Nashville General Hospital. The vast majority are women and half are people of color. There are people like Anne, who is an RN, who is passionate about the people in difficult situations that are thankful of her service because of the dignity and respect that she shows on a daily basis. That gives her gratitude to keep going on every day to continue to serve the patients of National General Hospital. There are also like Julius, executive chef, who can work anywhere in Nashville because of our booming city and the growing restaurants that are there. But he chose to work at National General Hospital because he's making a difference, not just collecting a paycheck. What's going to happen to these committed employees? The mayor stated in her op-ed that Metro is going to absorb these employees. How is Metro government going to absorb 800 workers, especially ones that have highly specialized skills? Where are we going to put an equity tech? Where are we going to put a labor and delivery nurse? Our Metro Health Department cannot absorb these people, and where else in Metro are they going to go? 
The employees have made many sacrifices in the past. They were kicked out of the pension plan, they have taken furloughs, and they have taken pay cuts. What message does this send to the employees to have shown this type of dedication? That's why over 100 employees came out to the hospital authority, board, uh, hospital authority board meeting last Friday. This is the reason why you're getting phone calls. This is the reason why the tenancy is reporting and why some staff members are resigning to, to look for jobs elsewhere so they won't miss a paycheck. This is the reason the announcement about the future general hospital was poorly conceived and poorly executed. In addition to the unnecessary turmoil, this is going to create unintended consequences that will have a ripple effect on the rest of Davidson County. What's going to happen to the tens of thousands of people that General Hospital is currently serving that are unable to pay? Who's going to service the inmates that General Hospital provides health care? What's going to happen to Metro and school employees that use, that use General Hospital under a Metro Health Incentive Program? Where are they going to turn to when General Hospital is gone and they have to watch their premiums and copay increase? What's going to happen when Metro cannot absorb these employees and have to talk about layoffs of laying off a hundred of hundreds of Davidson County residents? What's going to happen to the homeless who have to get emergency care during the cold Metro months that are coming up? After the 2010 flood, we adopted the creed. We are Nashville. We are people in need. We are neighbors who care. We are diverse and eclectic and eccentric, excuse me, and eclectic too. We are proud and generous. We are rebuilding. We are recovering. We are volunteers. We are lifting each other up because we are Nashville. That's what makes me proud to be a Nashvillian. I keep this frame on my wall to remind me why I do the work that I do. And reflecting on decisions that are being made by General Hospital, I have to ask myself, and I ask you, are we still that Nashville? Have we changed so much becoming the it city that getting a soccer stadium, zoning for more tall and skinnies, having a bridge to nowhere is more important than taking care of our own? Thank you for our time. Thank you, Ms. Player. Um, council members, do you have any questions as it relates to SEIU, um, fiscally, uh, the human capital aspect for the proposal for the restructuring of general? Council Member Davis. Thank you, Madam President. <laughs> how are you today? Thank you. Uh, how many um, SEIU employees are there at, at Metro General right now? Um, I'm the political director. I'm the president. Brad Rayson is our president. Um, but the, uh, we represent 800 um, National General employees, and 800 are in our bargaining unit. Got you, got you, got you. Um, last but um, not last but not least, and there's a method to my madness when asking this question. Uh, if you don't have it, you can email or give it to me later. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the average salary of the SC, of an SEIU employee there at Metro General? Um, well, the starting pay is roughly about eleven dollars an hour. Uh, we can go towards I am. It's a, it's a range of salaries just because we represent everyone from the environmental service to up to the RN. So there's a range. So we can get that average for you. But the starting rate is at around about eleven dollars and forty six cents, I believe. So this would affect um, those who are probably making less than forty a year, probably thirty five oh, a year. Definitely, definitely. It, it's not uncommon for our members to have two jobs to make ends meet. I would say, yeah, the majority of them make probably roughly around, even by less than that, around $30,000 a year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Schulman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so again, how many, uh, you have 800 employees? We order? represent 800 General hospital, hospital employees. employees, yes. Okay. That's, that's in their bargaining unit that we represent as a whole. Okay. When we and those are just at school. General Hospital? Yes. All right. That's not Davidson County Metro Government, Metro Schools. That's not include those. Okay. Um, longest employees? Do you know how long the longest employees have been there? Oh, easily over 25 years. They probably average around seven to ten years at least, right. but easily just, over 25 just years. Just curious who has been there a long time, who yeah. has seen all these things happen to, to General. Um, my last question is, um, and I'm sure I've been told this before, but they were taken off the pension plan? Yes. Is that right? 
did that happen back when General moved? When did it can happened, you just give us a history? About ten of, years ago, it happened okay. about 2006 okay. when they were taken off the General Metro um, employee pension plan and went into their own okay. contribution plan. And do you mind, um, just for background, just give us an idea of what happened and why that happened? Or do it, you know why it happened? That type of thing. I mean, it was, it was, it was said to help with the financial stability of the, the hospital. Um, that was the reason that it was given to help keep the hospital going. And so to, to transfer out of them out of the Metro General, gen, metro, uh, general Government uh, Defined Benefit Plan. Okay, so 2006, you think, is when it happened? Yes. And did, was there another plan established for them? Yeah, so a contribution plan was established separate and apart. Contribution plan. Okay. Yes. Anything else that the employees over time have lost? Uh, they lost pay just because, you know, when uh, s several years ago before the previous administration, everyone from management all the way to our members and our employees took a, uh, I believe it was a 4% pay cut um, across the board to help keep the hospital going. And uh, when was that, do you remember? Um, about seven years ago. All right, thanks. Thank you, Councilman. Council Lady, Sh Council Lady Hart. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for being here. Nashville General, used to serve as the administrator over Bordeaux? The hospital board did, yes. Mm -hmm. The hospital authority board. And what was the, um, what was the morale like during that time? It was disheartening. Anytime you outsource a service, um, it tells the employees that um, their services aren't being completely valued. And it's also hard, I mean, basically on their pocketbooks. I mean, you start taking away their benefits because they don't have the same quality of benefits as their fellow Metro employees do, even within the own hospital authority. Um, pay went down. Um, there was issues when first getting, um, working with the administration to get union recognition and we had to come back to the council to make sure that was ensured during the transition process. Um, so it was, I mean, it was a difficult time that employees that dedicated their time and energy and effort and who weren't getting the same quality of pay that they would in the private sector, but did it for the care and the mission of the hospital authority and for the quality benefits, then that was shown that the sacrifices they're making to make sure the hospitals run at a, you know, at a high quality level and the commitment to serve their community, um, no matter who you were in Nashville, that you knew you had a place to go, I mean, that was disappointing and disheartening that you're here to provide a service. You know, we all, you serve, you're elected to serve the public. You do it out of commitment, and they were seeing, doing the same thing, to show commitment to the Nashville residents, that they're here to serve them when they have no place to go and they need help, that there was someone to serve them with dignity and respect and to treat them like their own, because they were family members. They were former council members, family members, and they would make sure during their last years they were treated well and treated with dignity like we all would during our last waiting years when our health is not the best or ideal like we want it to be. I actually had two or three other questions, but I think you answered them all in your statement. So thank you very much. Thank you, Council Lady Hurt. This will be our last question for SEIU. Councilman Cooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, um, Ms. Player, for being here. Um, the collective bargaining agreement by SEIU and the city for the Metro General Employers, um, is any of the agreement triggered or affected by this plan to close? Uh, we have an MOU with the hospital authority. Yes. Um, and so the MOU is not with the Metro government, it's with the hospital authority. Um, there is not anything triggered because we always work from the place of it's with Metro, it's with the hospital authority and it will always be under the hospital of Metro general government, government budget wise and the management will be under the hospital authority. But there's no uh, severance costs in termination of employment language that's in the MOU? That's, there's a clause There's a clause for us to work out as that happens, to work yeah. with the administration. If such a situation arise, how would that look like? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Player. Thank you. We'll now hear from uh, Representative Hera Love that would provide us information, uh, the, the fiscal impact for this proposal as it relates to the state.
Mr. Vice Mayor and members of the council and Chair Lady, uh, thank you for uh, taking time out to uh, hear just a little bit of what we have been deliberating uh, among the delegation about what would be the impact of closing Metro General Hospital. Our concern is about the fact that when you look across the state, I think there are three uh, state uh, identified uh, safety net hospitals and closing the one here in Nashville would negatively impact uh, the amount of money that we would receive back from the federal government. We talk about taking care of indigent patients and those who don't have insurance. So I'm sorry I don't have a full report of what the full uh, state impact would be, uh, but these are just some preliminary numbers. We may look at around $36 million uh, from state 10 care dollars and possibly uh, another 15 to 16 million from a state supplement pool. So that's the concern we have uh, about the impact from a state level uh, if Nashville Metro General were to no longer be operating as it is as a hospital now. Thank you, Representative Love. So I believe that's about 52 million approximately. Yes. Council Lady Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. If, if other hospitals absorb the patients who can no longer go to the safety net, does that money flow to them or would it only flow to an officially designated safety net hospital? I think it only flows to an officially designated state, uh, a safety net hospital designated such. Uh, but I'm open to uh, be corrected if I'm not correct about that. But that is my belief. Okay, thank you. Council Lady Weiner. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. And Representative Love, thank you for being here. We are anxious to, to hear from you. Yes, ma'am. I have one question insofar as the monies that we receive. If we're getting roughly $52 million, how much of that money actually goes to general annually? That money goes into the state pool. That's disseminated to all three safety net hospitals uh, and anyone? Okay. How much of that money do you know goes to general? I'm not sure of how much actually goes back to general. Okay, could somebody from the administration get that information for us? Yes, we can get that. It's, it is significantly less than the 55. Okay, I'd also, secondarily, to follow up what Council Lady Allen just asked, I'd also like to know um, a little bit more, if you can kind of give us a little deeper dive on that information as well as um, if the federal money comes directly to the hospitals that are seeing the patients, if they're, you know, farmed out, referred out to other facilities in the event that the facility does close. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Lady. Seeing no other questions, thank you so much, Representative Love. It's always a pleasure when we have our state officials come down and visit us in our chambers. Thank you all for having us down here. And uh, I do hope that we really consider the impact uh, that this will have on all of our citizens, because we do share all of them. Uh, they're not just Metro citizens, but they also are state citizens. Thank you. Great point. Thank you so much. We'll now hear from um, uh, Sheriff Hall. Uh, he'll come down and provide an overview as to um, this proposal and the impact on uh, the services that they provide and the operation as it relates to, to General Hospital. Thank you, Sheriff. Oh, you ready? And you're on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, um, I was asked, I guess, to come up and give you a little bit of an update on what, what this would mean to the Sheriff's Office. Uh, to give you a little bit of an idea, that is where we house um, inmates who are an, almost what you would call a step-down unit after they've received surgeries and various medical uh, procedures and they're not allowed to go back to the jail facilities. As we sit here today, there would be some five to six inmates in a lockup ward at the hospital. 
Uh, why that affects us all is because we staff that with one officer uh, supervising those six to seven inmates a day uh, in that unit. And then we have officers scattered all through the hospital for individual care. So what happens is that if you take those, those inmates out of that lockup ward and send them to any other place in the city, and we have officers sitting at Vanderbilt and other places, um, we're gonna have to quadruple our cost at least unless you get a lockup ward built in one of those hospitals because every inmate requires two officers if they're by themselves. So we've done the math and we look around and it's a, it's a issue for us dollar wise, some three and a half million dollars, 3.3, 3.4 million dollars a year the sheriff's office would need to staff the inmates scattered all through the city. Um, that's one issue. The other one is, quite frankly, we're, we're not real popular in other hospitals. Um, it's a tough thing to do. Um, just a year or so ago, right out here at, at Hundred Oaks, you saw a very tragic event that took place. It's the most dangerous time when you're dealing with inmates. And we have a, a fantastic relationship with General. They're, they're used to us, they like us, and we like them. And so it's a, it's a relationship worth noting as well as the cost that it would require us as a city to, to invest in our agency to, to move them. So, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Sheriff. Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. Sheriff, so let, let's dive a little deeper on the 3.5 million. Um, when you say it would quadruple, uh, quadruple the cost, um, help me understand that just a little bit better if you would please, sir. Yeah, so um, if you have five inmates there today, you're paying one officer 24 hours a day uh, to do that. If you shut that down and take those five inmates, it would require 10 officers to supervise them in individual rooms in some other hospital. And you do the math and that adds up in our budget somewhere around 2.8, 2.9 million dollars. We'd need an additional vehicles to transport them in other hospitals where we get to go to and from. There's another component I failed to mention just a second ago. If you, if you allow inmate supervision to be called corrections, that's what that is. We also do the security at the hospital uh, in the parking lots and all over the, the building. Um, by the way, Ms. Player, I'm, I forgot this, but uh, they also represent our, our employees out there as well and, um, and the security staff that are out there. And so it's uncertain. Uh, I'm not sure what would happen if, if that went away. They, they would then be included in the numbers, I guess, and added to what Ms. Player presented. So the correction side, watching inmates, is the $3 million. The, the security issue would need to be addressed moving forward. You'd, you would have no need for those employees to be out there if there wasn't a hospital. Okay, and so what you've got is you have a specialized area in the hospital. Uh, I'll call it a confinement area, for, for lack of a better word. Is, am I understanding that correctly? Yes, sir. And to the administration, if we negotiated that with this uh, supposedly private contract that we uh, are, are looking at doing? We haven't negotiated anything. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Councilman Glover. Any other questions for Sheriff Hall as this proposal for the restructuring of the General Hospital may impact? Um, Councilman Cooper. Thank you, um, Chair Lady. Um, while the Sheriff is here, I just wanted to be sure to completely understand this. This is $2.8 in additional cost under a different health care arrangement for the inmates. Yes, sir, that would not be health care costs. It's only the security costs that would require us to do it. The only way around that would be to negotiate with another hospital to give us an entire ward to secure. Then you'd have to pay to upgrade that. So I'm assuming if that didn't happen, you would have to put the inmates in individual rooms in some hospital, and we would have to secure those for you. But you would anticipate $2.8 in additional cost to your department? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Cooper. Councilman Hager. Thank you, Sheriff Hall, for showing up. Um, are these all inpatient uh, inmates when you take them out there? We have both um, people who are coming in and being released. The group I'm really talking about that I worry more about from a cost perspective are the ones that are basically stepped down from a surgical procedure that aren't ready to go back to, to your jails. Even the new facilities being built will not be able to handle them in an infirmary style care. So they stay at the hospital until they're released and then they come to us. Any average day, it's between five to seven inmates, and I'm using the low end of that number of how many people are in that lockup ward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Hager. <laughs> Council Lady Hart. Thank you, Madam Chair. So let me help me understand. So you're saying that the risk 
would be uh, more. It would be increased because you might have to um, have different locations for the inmates to be, and because of that, you've got to, uh, the, the risk is increased is basically what I'm saying. There's a cost for sure, and, and I think there is a risk added to what we would do. It would be our preference if you move this operation, move the entire thing to another hospital, give us a unit that's secure, pay to secure that unit, and let us staff it with what it would take. That seems unlikely to me. I have no idea what other hospitals are being considered. I'm just talking about what's more likely is that you would spread officers all over the hospital watching uh, the same number of inmates. It would cost you m many more dollars to do it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Councilman Hastings. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to ask you, Sheriff, and thank you for being here, like thank always. You. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask a question, because I know we did, uh, you know, a little while ago, talk about the mental health aspect of utilizing uh, our hospital and our facility. Are we currently doing that now, or were we, are we moving towards utilizing the facilities for mental health? Uh, and <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, but also looking at the aspect of if we are looking at doing that uh, towards our hospital, because I know it's costing us millions of dollars for outsourcing with private facilities. And by using that, how would that uh, help us in making sure that the, uh, the correction system is, is dealt with in a proper way? Yeah, it's a really big, it's a tough issue. Uh, we are building across the street a behavioral care center uh, that will sit adjacent to the new facility that will help all of us. It's, it will be, uh, I think, a, a really improved situation for the mentally ill. The group you're talking about, though, are, are, are being taken tonight by the police department and others uh, to the hospital. Obviously, that's a very convenient situation. We've, we've used it for years. And, and so the sheriff's office and the police department are in and out of general on a regular basis. There are shared services that occur because of that. We're doing security. We're doing corrections. And they are also inside the hospital. Uh, it concerns me moving forward about that as well, because if you start breaking it all apart, uh, we do lo lose some continuity of services there. So uh, and mental health is a big piece of that. Um, and I just hope that you guys and, and the city negotiates with whoever, if that's what we end up doing, uh, that that specific part of, of care. Mental health is a very difficult thing for all of us to deal with. Thank you so much, Sheriff. Any other questions for the Sheriff? Thank you so much, Sheriff Hall. It's always a pleasure. Now we will have our Director of Finance um, to provide us an, an overview where we are, where we were, where we're going. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at the request of the Budget and Finance Chair, I have provided you a history of the uh, general hospital subsidies since 2005. That should be on your desk. I was asked to provide that for today's session. Councilman, if you don't have it, we can get it to you. Okay, well, I have provided you the history of the, uh, of the general hospital subsidy, and it is broken down into a schedule between uh, what general hospital received in Bordeaux and Knowles. And so when you see that schedule, please pay attention to that because um, pr prior to um, uh, Knowles and Bordeaux being rolled off, it was included in the uh, general hospital overall subsidy. So it's important to segregate that in the schedules, and we have done that. So what it shows is that since the year 2005, Metro has provided a total subsidy of $689 million to the uh, hospital authority. And that's the uh, information I was asked to provide. And then um, in terms of the current year, the current year budget, we allocated $35 million to the hospital authority. They requested an additional uh, 20 plus million dollars for the um, current year. Uh, we have weekly calls with their CFO to talk about, to, to talk about the status 
of their budget. And uh, we have been advised that the board has been meeting in strategy sessions over the past few months to address that gap between um, the amount requested and the $35 million uh, sub uh, subsidy that was provided. Uh, since, those, since that information was discussed in strategy session, we've not been privy to the detail of the options that the uh, board has been considering in terms of what their options may be. And I will take any quite specific questions that you all have now. Councilman Glover. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. So when we get our weekly briefing from the Tennessean on, on what we're doing, um, my, my question is, is simply this. And I say that because, I mean, we get caught off guard frequently. Yep. And so do we have a stop loss? The, the contract that we're talking about doing privately, is there a stop loss on the amount of money that the city is willing to supplement for whatever contract we do? When I asked the question, have we considered the, the uh, sheriff's, uh, I, I'm going to call it a quandary because obviously we can't just turn our backs on all of these situations. Have we thought it all the way through and, and where are we exactly in the process? In, in terms of the process, where we are is Meharry and HCA agreed to terms of a, um, for their students. Uh, the city is in the position now of determining what the next steps are in terms of um, how to uh, provide services when that arrangement goes into place. We have not contracted with anyone. We have, uh, we're in the position right now of uh, trying to get together uh, a strategy to bring all of the stakeholders to the table so that we can determine the exact next steps. And what we are doing is we're going to involve everybody in this community in that discussion, including many of the people in the back of this room. Uh, that will not be a unilateral decision that's made by the mayor's office. Everyone will be involved. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Councilman. Councilman Cooper. Um, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Talia. Always a, a pleasure to hear from you. A couple of quick questions. The 35 million subsidy from last year, um, my memory is that the finance department was going to have a slightly different procedure in administering that 35 million. That's been being drawn down since July 1st in the beginning of the fiscal year. How much money is left and how much have we been dispersing on a monthly basis? What we have done in the current year, in July we um, released um, a significant piece, and don't hold me to this number, I can get you the details, but um, be, beyond that, I think it was in the neighborhood maybe of five million, and what we agreed we would release in terms of providing funding to the authorities, we would just provide monthly installments based on the availability that was remaining, and I think that was in the neighborhood of plus or minus 1.5 million a month, and we have told the authority that if their cash flow showed that they needed that cash any quicker, that we are amenable to receiving that request and getting money to them quicker, and that has not been requested as of this date. Okay. So what's the remaining balance of the, of the, like, the subsidy for F this fiscal year? I'm, I'm, I'm going to think it's about half that's left okay. that they have not yet drawn down, but let, let me get you the specific number right after this, okay? Okay, and then a quick, quick second question. The Meharry HCA announcement, what operating effect would that have on General Hospital? I, ca I can't take, the, I can't take okay. that question in terms of how that impacts their operations. Okay. That's best suited but you're not for a, them. But you're not aware of an estimate? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Davis. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Director Lomax, how are you today? I'm doing great. Okay. So, so right now, on average, you're saying that we've um, given over last was it since 2005 um, over 600 million dollars? Uh, specific 689 million is Six, what is on the spreadsheet. 689 million dollars. Um, and this may be a question um, for you or our legal counsel, Mr. Jamison. 
Now, I know statewide we do charge impact fees um, to the larger hospitals to help with our indigent care hospitals. Um, is there a possibility that since, you know, we are the healthcare capital of the South, maybe the nation, and to have an indigent care hospital for a population this size to be in trouble, you know, is, is troubling to me and many other people. That's why we're here today. Is there a possibility for us to charge an impact fee or something to HCA or other hospitals who, who aren't as impacted by this as we are? And another thing, and these are tough questions too, mm -hmm. and I'm willing to go there. Um, and I know I've talked to people from your office and the mayor's office, you know, looking at cutting dollars in certain areas because having a, an indigent care hospital is very important. And, and there's plenty of places I feel, and I mean, this is not something easy, but to save the hospital, I don't mind being the bad guy when I'm trying to save everything here. Um, the possibility of maybe, you know, we do funds for sidewalks to help pay for that. Is there somewhere that we could look at where we could charge an additional fee to provide extra dollars to um, Metro? I'm not asking for a tax increase or anything like that, but there's got to be a way because even though I'm not, I'm not going after the hotel motel, but I'm using that as an example. I mean, we use the hotel motel taxes to pay for certain things in the city. Is There's got to be a way, and this could be to you or Mr. Jameson, and I've started looking. I just got to know what I can do by the law, you know, without impacting Mary and Joe taxpayer here. Um, some sort of fee to help mitigate this cost, to help, because because to have our hospital in jeopardy is, is very concerning to me, and I'm also going to have some tough questions for HCA, Meharry, and hospital board members themselves also. So if we can look at, you know, some other ways to pull in some money. I mean, we're gonna do a charter amendment, you know, to help pay for transit, which is very important when we need it. But there's gotta be a way for us to do something similar to help save our hospital. And if you can look for some ideas, and I'll work with you, um, Mr. Jameson, our Madam Chair, our Health and Hospitals Chair, um, you know, which, you know, she has some great ideas also where we could probably find some money to help mitigate these situations. And okay. I, I understand your question, but that is definitely a question for either our law director or uh, Mr. Jameson to take. And I don't know if either of them wants to take that up now. Councilman Davis, um, the Metro Legal in our office is frequently asked about impact fees. And generally speaking, uh, the state uh, General Assembly passed legislation, I believe, in 2006, the County Powers Authority Act, that essentially restricted our ability to assess impact fees. You may have seen in other counties where impact fees are assessed, uh, even counties next door, and I believe that's because the state legislation provided that if you already have impact fees in place, they can persist, but you can't otherwise enact new ones, so that is a severe restriction on our part. So just so I'm clear, that there's state, just so I'm correct, Mr. Jameson, that there is state legislation that may or may not, that may prevent us for assessing such kind of fees right now, an impact fee or something to help the hospital? Council Lady Hurt. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here. And, and I'm gonna need some help. Okay. Um, <clears throat> because I, I'm, I'm concerned in trying to understand the the flow of things. So when Met when Metro General was on Hermitage Avenue, did they have financial issues then? Do you know? I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, was that before 2005? When yes, so it was before exactly. 2005, before the merger with, with uh, Hubbard Hospital. Right, and, and I was not here back at that time, so I don't want to recreate history. I'm, I was just, I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, we can, I, I we can get that. Why don't we just get you, um, Is your specific question is, Yeah, I'm just wondering, trying to see the climate. I'm trying to understand how things happen, because if yeah. they had, if they were running a great hospital and everything was good and the finances were good before, they just had a dilapidated building, 
and then they came over to Hubbard Hospital because Hubbard Hospital was a good building that was underused then and they needed patients and they needed doctors and they needed those things that were going to make it a successful hospital then it just seems like bringing the two together was the perfect marriage to run a great hospital. And then having this safety net hospital added to it where they would receive the subsidy to make sure that they provided for indigent people, it should have been doing well. So something happened and, and, and someone said to me that we need to do uh, a preventive plan as opposed to doing an autopsy. And it just seems to me that we are doing an autopsy now. But if we found out, if, if we found out what the problem was, how it exist, you know, what created it, and we worked towards that because since I've been on the council, there's been a $35 million um, subsidy given, and they've come back and requested 16 million, which says that they obviously needed 51 million. So had they gotten the 51 million up front, then it wouldn't have been a problem, and, and, and or, 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 or large of a problem as it is. Just like in this budget hearing, they said they needed 55 million, but we still gave them 35 million, so it's like, Hold how on, can they? Lady. I'm gonna ask the audience, please refrain uh, from, from applauding. I know this is really emotional for everyone, but we do have a decorum in, in this chamber. Go ahead, Council Lady. So if you're behind and you, you know, you're running at the same speed as the person in front of you and they're already a mile ahead and you all both are running at the same speed and you're going to the same place, the one that's ahead, you won't catch up unless you are able to go faster. And the same way is, is with money. If you are in debt and you're trying to come even or trying to become what Metro General was before coming to Hubbard Hospital, and you're not getting enough money to do it, then it's almost like it was a recipe for failure. And it, to me, I, I don't know, maybe you, you, you can help me understand. I, 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 I'm, I'm do just, we have a question, Council Lady? Yeah, the question is, is how much money or how was Metro General financed before? And how do we expect a hospital who has been underfunded operate when they don't have enough money. We'll have them provide that information to you. That predates uh, my director, and that wasn't within the scope that they was charged with for the information to provide the committee. So we'll get that information but to I you. But I guess, you know, if you know where you've been, then you kind of gives you a way of where you need Duly to go. Duly noted, Council Lady, we'll get it to you. Councilman Schulman. Thank you, Madam Chair and Director, and if I'm outside okay. the scope, let me know this as well. Okay. Uh, but. Um, now I'm confused. Um, all right, and so maybe you can walk me through or you can just okay. direct me. Um, so uh, what I was doing was looking for the letter that we originally got that started some of this, which says that the general hospital is going to change. Uh, and I was looking for the letter because I thought we were talking about different ways of, of what was going to happen to general. Mm -hmm. um, but now what I just heard you say is that now we're bringing stakeholders to the table to talk about what's going to happen. So was there not a plan when the initial announcement was made last week about what was going to happen to General, or has something changed? That's, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, I can, I can take that question. In terms of uh, last week's announcement, due to the uh, HCA and the Meharry partnership, the mayor made an announcement that we would no longer do have inpatient hospital services and that we would begin to analyze moving to an ambulatory care model. That was the announcement. How that happens and in terms of schedule, in terms of transition, in terms of specific partnerships, 
those details have not been determined and we want to make sure that everyone is at the table and that we move forward in a positive way to, um, to continue to provide some level of service at that site. So we need to have community discussions around what those services need to be. Okay, but, um, and again, without, and I don't want to get into a running dialogue because mm -hmm. we can talk about this, but mm -hmm. um, so the plan is to not provide inpatient or uh, inpatient hospital services. Yes, that's The plan is, what is was to turn it into an ASTC. Yes. All right, so there, so when you said everything that all the stakeholders are going to come to the table, it's the stakeholders to do that plan. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So are there already plans that have been addressed? Uh, are there already, I guess, the, I'm not getting into a lot of details, um, is there already a plan that somebody's looked at to do that and now we're going to bring other people in? Or no, there's not. There, there is no plan? No, there is no detailed plan in terms of how we get from where we are today to that new model. Okay, so, okay. Um, well, two last questions. One is, um, if there is no plan, um, what if, what if um, turning it into an ASTC is not the right plan? Is that up subject to negotiations? Uh, I guess right. my and question would be. I can't speak to, you okay. know, speak to that specifically, but um, we'll just work our way through it. Okay. But uh, if you I bring mean, stakeholders to the table and all of a sudden it says, wait a minute, maybe right. we well, should they be need doing to have, this instead. I agree with you, Councilman. They okay. need to have reasonable expectations around what that means. I absolutely agree with you on that. All right. And then I guess the one last question that goes back to what the sheriff was talking about. Inmate mm -hmm. care, if we were to... Uh, let's say we were to get rid of that contract. Where's mm -hmm. that going to go? Do, do we have any idea at this point? Have we, have we looked we, at that? We do not know that today. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Council Lady Van Rees. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the question about inmate care. Uh, I had another question as well. Um, my father is a retired oral surgeon, maxillofacial surgery, and um, taught at the University of Oklahoma, and I know that the McHarry dental students also uh, participate um, at the hospital, and it's one of the, the best dental schools in the nation. And I haven't heard anyone talk about the dental program, and I just want to make sure that as we're talking about how this is going to work, that we're including that in the process. Do you have any comment or any information at all regarding the I, I dental? have heard nothing myself around the dental program being impacted by this. Okay. Because if they would have to confirm that. But yeah, I, haven't. I didn't hear anything in the Meharry uh, deal that had anything to do with the dental school. So if uh, someone could get back to me on that, would be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Council Lady. Council Lady Weiner. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. And again, tell you if this needs to be directed elsewhere, I'm okay. more than happy to do so. Have we looked at, just in terms of best practices, have we looked at the other safety net hospitals in our own state and identified the number of patients that they have, that they see annually as compared to ours, the per capita expenses, the per patient expenses that they have as compared to ours, what the landscape is for each community, in other words, the, comp the competitive hospitals? Yes, that we have been reviewing some reports that come out of the state that has that data. Could that be shared with us? Yes. Thank you. And have we looked at, and this may very well be a question for Dr. Webb, the impact, we've, we're talking about the impact of potentially closing the facility on the employees and the inmates and, and everybody else that we're talking about, but have we really also looked at the impact of the Meharry and HCA contract on the potential decline in patients that will be admitted as a result of the students training elsewhere. Do we have knowledge about that? Or? I don't. I, I do not have access to that. That, it, that would be information between Meharry and HCA in terms of their contract. Okay. I'll ask Dr. Webb that, too, mm -hmm. when he comes up here. Thank you, Chair. That's all I have. Thank you, Council Lady. Councilman Hager. Uh, Ms. Lomax for being here. Thank you. Um, I received this report, I guess it came out of finance about over the years, the amount of money General Hospital's mm -hmm. gotten. Is that correct? That is correct. And I've noticed the last, what, three years, we've done more subsidy than we did before. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. 
Now, we were here about six or seven months ago, and I remember that your department was working with them to try to get their financials back in order, and there was an issue about six or seven million that uh, they didn't collect because they didn't file on time. Did they ever go back and try to collect that money or get it done, or do you recall? Uh, I rem We did have conversations about that, and they may be able to talk about it in more detail, but um, based on the information provided to us, they reported that all of that $6 million was not a valid receivable. So it couldn't be collected then? Exactly. Is that because of the late filing or just not collectible, period? I'd prefer that they answer that question. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Hastings. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to, um, um, uh, with, with you being here, and I know it's a lot of information that you don't know and we're stuck in and we're in the middle. That's First okay. of all, before I talk, I just wanted to let, let you know and everyone else know after speaking with others, I am not in support of this at all. Um, the question was asked to you about Meharry uh, and the relationship with the hospital. There is zero issues with that because they will still will have a relationship with Metro General Hospital. Gosh dog it, it's on their campus, all right? Uh, there's also some issues that we don't talk about, which I'll hit very, very quickly, is the state of Tennessee will lose $54 million in Medicaid subsidies that come to us for Metro General. Uh, we'll also have 16 min, uh, million that will be lost through the PHSP uh, through the state. We'll have $3 million essential assets through the uh, DSH as well. That will also be losses between $1.4 million and $2 million that will be felt, felt as well through that system. And we'll lose as well the assets. Now we talk about the hospital uh, being a hole in the wall. But we do have income coming in that we receive about 42 to $43 million. So all, all that said and done, we knew with our budget this, this past year that the hospital was going to be back because we gave the same thing that we gave before. And we have bigger issues. All the hospitals in this city are overflowing. You know, my, my wife was in the hospital at, at one of the HCA hospitals, and uh, she stayed in the, hospital, in the hallway for over a day and a half because there was nowhere to put her. Uh, those are the issues that we are having here with the city. Now, I know that you're, you're here to talk about the money, and the money is the, the main reason, the, the foremost things of where, where we're here. But pointing out those issues, we don't on, only look at what the report that you're giving but also the other assets that we're gonna lose from the federal government and also the state, the state house here in the state of Tennessee. So I just wanted to point that out. I know you can't necessarily say anything on that, but again, I'm not in support of this and I have made it known to the administration. Uh, this is something that's gonna bite us or whoever in the butt, but I'm not standing for that. I know there is some, some uh, pivotal grounds where people won't necessarily speak, but this is something that we definitely, definitely need to think about. And I just wanted to say that uh, so we can have that on record. And I know that's not you, but uh, uh, for the administration and for legal or whoever else that's over in that corner to let you guys know, take it back on the administrative side, that this is something that we need to take a bad step on. And, and surprisingly, when we ask questions, the main thing that we get is nobody's able to answer those questions for us. And it reminds me of something. Even on the state, you know, the, we'll talk about the federal government real quick. There was a, a individual that's in charge of the legal system that went before a body just like this. And he said, I'm not able to answer those questions. You know, before we get to the place to where we make a decision on people's lives, we better come up with some answers to be able to save individuals' lives in this city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Madam Director, as well. Uh, my question, I guess, is one of, of sort of analysis being done by your office. Um, 
So I know a couple of years ago now we had the opportunity to, through the state, uh, expand Medicaid, and we did not do that. Does your office have analysis, or are you planning to do analysis that would demonstrate the impact of the failure to expand Medicaid on the operations of Metro General or, or, or other things related to healthcare uh, delivery in Nashville? We do not have that today, but we absolutely need to gather that data. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Kendall. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director. Uh, I guess I'm a little confused now. Okay. I know a lot of questions have been asked and a lot of answers have not been given, not because you, you refuse to give them, but you just don't know. But it, I was at the meeting in the mayor's uh, office uh, that morning prior to the announcement of the HCA Meharry uh, partnership, and we were pretty excited about the partnership. We think, at least I was, I thought it made sense uh, to bring students back from about five different states where they're now getting their practical. But I don't, I, I, I can't seem to put together what the Meharry uh, HCA partnership has to do necessarily with Meharry, with, with General Hospital. Mm -hmm. And I know you've been asked that question sort of by Mr. Cooper and, and, and also Mr. Schumann. Uh, when will we get an answer to that? I mean, will, will someone from the mayor's office or administration come to us, not on the money necessarily, but talk about the plan and what is intended to happen there, and how, how does that relate to the Meharry HCA partnership? Uh, you will absolutely get a plan back so that you uh, have a good understanding of how we're going to proceed, and we would be asking this body to approve any plan. Will this body moving, be a, Moving forward. So we would not do that. Um, we can't do that by ourselves. Right. Uh, second of all, um, there, there is an intent that Metro continue to have a presence on that campus. What, what I can't tell you today is exactly what those services <coughs> will be. I wish I could tell you that very definitively and say we will do A, B, and C, but today I don't know what A, B, and C will be. Well, the, the, uh you talked about stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders that you'll be meeting with? Uh, can you? Uh, definitely, we'll, we plan on having representatives, um, someone to represent this body. We will make sure that employees are involved, uh, Meharry, uh, uh, individuals in this community that work on various um, uh, safety net uh, issues, safety net care in the city, and um, and we, we just need to come up with a list. If you have recommendations, on people that you would like to make sure are involved in that, send them to us. Will they be coming to hear a plan or to develop a plan? They will be coming to assist us with developing a plan. Okay, just 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 quickly and then I'm through. Uh, Ms. Wiener asked a question about other hospitals in the state, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and have, have you looked at those? I know there was an article in the paper, I believe, by mm -hmm. uh, Representative Gilmore yes. talking about the Memphis uh, situation of the hospital there and how they were able to work out a uh, situation there in cooperation with the private community. I don't know the details of that. Is that something that you would look at as yes. a beginning point? I mean, there, there are some uh, state reports that are available that can provide us some um, baseline data for us to look at. So we will, I think we'll need to have an opportunity to look at that first and then determine how, how much further we should go in terms of what additional analysis is needed. I guess what you're hearing today from some of the questions I've heard uh, being asked, are we really at a point where we, uh, that the administration has made the decision that they want this to be a clinic rather than a hospital, inpatient hospital, or is this still open for discussion? I believe <coughs> Mr. Schumann was getting at that. Yeah. And uh, the mayor has announced that um, she's moving toward a clinic model. You know, um, there could be discussions with her, but uh, I think she's firm on that decision. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Kendall. Okay. Just make sure. Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I'd like to summarize, if I may, what Councilman Schulman and even what Councilman uh, Kendall just said. I, I think that if the uh, contract went into effect 
on December the 1st between Meharry and HCA, what would the hospital makeup be today? So see, I think there have been decisions made. I think that things are in place because it apparently uh, contracts have been signed uh, and I don't know the details either. But my question is simply this, there are things that are already in play. What does that model look like right now without any other discussion on decisions that have already been made? I'm not asking you to come on the spot or answer the yeah. question right now. I think that, but, but uh, Chair, I, I would really like for us to have that information to where we are actually working on a level field to understand where we're beginning and where we might be trying to go. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Duly noted. Councilman Betnick. Thank you, Chair. Um, about 15 years ago, I developed cancer. Uh, I didn't know I had cancer. Uh, it showed up in the middle of my back. And if I didn't have insurance and a family doctor, I'd be dead because melanoma is a killer. And so I very early uh, was an early supporter of the Affordable Care Act because I believe that for personal experience, people that don't have access to insurance or a, or a, a real uh, medical service are likely to die, like I could have died if I didn't have a health insurance. I mean, some people will think that that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. But the point is, it's important that, that we have a safety net. So when I, look at, uh, when I look at what's happening right now with the federal government uh, and the people in the Congress intently trying to remove the Affordable Care Act and uh, defund it, and shift some of the costs to, to the cities. And we have a state that has refused to expand, creating also a hardship for us in the city. I know that we are in a pickle. I know that we have to uh, make a decision as a city if we believe that uh, providing health care for people, it's, it's a priority for us. Now, I hear people here uh, in the city talking about that we, the the hospital somehow it needs to be held to a different standard. But I look at the hospital like I look at the fire department or the police. You know, it's a service that we provide. We don't ask the fire department to uh, pay for the insurance or get some money out of the insurance to offset the cost of providing a safe city for people. I look at our hospital the same way. We need to provide a public service. We need to uh, provide that safety net. That's the way I look at it. I think if we don't do it, Clearly, the federal government or the state won't help us, so it's up to us. So I guess I just want to frame where I'm coming from. I think this is a thing that is a morally a moral imperative for us to make sure that people we serve are not going to die because they don't have. And I, I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm just trying to share mm -hmm. the way I look at it from my personal experience, that they won't die because they don't have access to a, a, a doctor or being able, like in my case, immediately after my doctor saw that I had a potential melanoma, sent me to a dermatologist who sent me to a surgeon who actually uh, was able to remove the melanoma from my back. I don't know that uh, we'll be able to do that if we move into a different direction with the hospital. So just wanted to, yes, ma'am. I would just like to comment that I think that the mayor agrees with you. And that's why, uh, and part of the announcement is a plan uh, for us to develop an indigent care fund so that those uh, folks that are not able to um, uh, afford services can receive quality health care in the city. Well, it's important to me that all people, all Nashville and taxpayers can have access to that indigent care. That's, that's And that is, I think that's our desire as well. We're going to try to get there. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Batney. Council Lady Johnson, Mina Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Director Lomax O'Neill. I do have one number specific question and big picture question. Okay. And first number specific question is um, FY 1415. Uh, it says total subsidies 35 million. Uh, that include uh, Boulder Nose uh, operating subsidy of 7.331 million. That's correct. And uh, 1516 
uh, jump up to 45 million and 51 million. And especially 16, 17 is 51 million. Uh, while uh, Boldo knows a subsidy is substantially low, like a half million. So I understand jump is, you know, 60 million, uh, like a, you know, uh, account payable, a one-time cost and so forth. But I'm just curious why FY14, 15 was uh, such low number, 35 million, including 7.3 million subsidy. Uh, that's just what the subsidy was when uh, Bordeaux and Knowles were still under the hospital authority. So as those organizations um, uh, uh, moved out of the hospital authority, we did not reduce the subsidy uh, that was going to the hospital authority. So they got the benefit of that increased appropriation on the uh, general hospital side when those appropriations went away. So what you're seeing here is that those contracts that had previously been paid by the hospital authority going away, which really gave them more availability. Yeah, that's my uh, question precisely. So, you know, 7.3 million subsidy went away from, you know, uh, long-term care facility. So in essence, general hospitals should have more among 35 million. And why are they increased, uh, the subsidy was increased after subsidy to the long-term care was reduced? Uh, I, would, I would like for them to take that question specifically because I can just tell you what I heard um, is that, um, you know, they just had increased costs and uh, issues with um, revenue, revenue collections over those years. And I would like to add that if you recall at the time when we came back for the $16 million supplemental last year, those were characterized to the administration as well as this body as being one-time needs to uh, catch up with some old AP and other costs. They were not um, necessarily presented as, continue, as funding needed for continued operations. Thank you. So now it comes to a big uh, picture question. I understand uh, the model to shift to uh, clinic care. So, uh, you know, essentially ending inpatient care was a uh, decision was already made by the mayor or administration. However, I understand you, you do not have any specific or any model to turn into that uh, clinical model. So in that SS, I understand uh, the data shows 80-20 uh, or 90-10 have you know, less inpatient care. However, how can you be so sure or what made you decide uh, ending the inpatient care is the best decision going forward? I, I think I probably need to get the mayor to um, provide you a response to that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady uh, Mina Johnson. Council members that's in the queue, just for the sake of time, Council Lady Weiner, were you seeking recognition again? Council Lady Weiner. Thank you. This is just a quick question for legal. Mr. Jameson, can you share with us um, specific information that you and I talked about this afternoon insofar as if the emergency department is closed, how does this impact the charter? A uh, couple of provisions under the charter. Uh, section one of the charter provides essentially core responsibilities of a metropolitan government and lays out exactly what you would suspect, police department, fire department, and it does mention hospitals. That section does, however, then go on to specifically provide that um, any of those core functions or responsibilities, the council can declare by ordinance to be obsolete. Uh, also, uh, the state legislature passed the Hospital Authorities Board Act, which empowered hospital authority boards uh, to act on behalf of hospitals that likely preempts that section of the charter. Section two provides um, for uh, physicians and nurses at General Hospital to provide emergency services. Um, I don't believe a decision uh, has yet been made regarding what would happen to the emergency facility at General Hospital, so we don't know that that is triggered. Um, 
and also just to finish one more thought on what section one provides, there's no definition specifically of hospital that requires an inpatient facility. Um, under the state legislation, under Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, any building that provides treatment, even if it's temporary, could qualify as a hospital. So that's kind of the gamut of what the charter provides. Thank you. I have one more, one more thing. Go ahead, Councilor. Um, as a medical practice consultant myself, in smaller practices, I don't deal with hospitals, but I always advise my practice owners to make strategic decisions based on a robust analysis. And clearly, that's not here. We don't have all the information we need. I'm personally looking forward to gathering as much information from the administration and from the hospital as possible to know what the right path is and to be able to make that decision based on all of the information and not just pieces of it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Councilman Davis, are you seeking additional recognition? Be brief. Our budget um, this year that we passed, um, don't have the exact numbers to front it, but it was close to $2 million or $1.9 million. Billion. One point nine million. Sorry, one point nine <laughs> billion, billion. But two billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And if my math is correct, if we um, five percent, if we did a five percent cut, what if we asked every department to not do it, but bring forward? I know sometimes the mayor asked for a three percent or five percent cut in budgets for each department. Looking at that, and like I said, these are tough times right now, and this is just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we have to make the hard decisions. And I'm willing to help make those hard decisions to save our hospital. And so if we look at a 5% budget cut, maybe taking half that 5%, going towards debt reduction, and then also going towards um, stabilizing our hospital, and then coming up with, a, with further plans. Um, I'm going to be asking you some questions. I'll send them the email. I'll share with my colleagues. And asking for those kinds of cuts. And definitely not wanting to lay anybody off or... Or, or, you know, just trying to see um, how, what positions are open in other, other departments, what can we live without in order to save the hospital right now, and just looking at those tough decisions, you know, if, you know just so that we can save this hospital is very important, and, and maybe looking at other aspects of where we can save, you know, money in order to um, address this issue. And sometimes you got to make those decisions, be it a two per, maybe it's a 2% cut you know, in order to stabilize the hospital um, at this time, and I'm willing to help make those. Okay. Thank you, Council. It's always an option. Councilman Leonardo. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, you know, I understand that Knowles and Bordeaux are not under the hospital authority, okay? Uh, but I do see the money coming from the same place, that being taxpayers, and I do see them providing care for the same people, and that is the most vulnerable uh, amongst us here in this town. Uh, right now, it's not an indictment of signature. I think that Mr. Mays and them are doing a good job, but there's no adequate assurance of performance in the future. To the contrary, they're not building the, the hospital that they had talked about building. And so I would like for any uh, evaluation of this going forward to take into account uh, what we would do if signature does back out here in 14 months, because that's another 12 or 13 million in health care back to the taxpayers that I think in all due fairness should be considered when we're considering any sort of future legislation on Metro General. Okay. But uh, secondarily, uh, when you talk about the, um, the indigent uh, fund, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's hard to arrive at a number if, if this fund is going to pay various hospitals that allow indigent people to get care, it, are they going to pay the insurance rate that is just 50 percent off because you don't have insurance? Or, for example, if an MRI is 3,800, but yet the, the insurance provider only pays six for that, I mean, what rate would be charged per hospital? Because before we could arrive at an overall amount and the indigent fund like that, we have to know that we're all on the same page uh, with what the service provider is going to charge. And so have we done anything about finding that out so that we can better get the information we need to, to legislate effectively? Yes, we, ha we have all of that down. Um, l let me just remind everyone that when this was announced, the mayor did not announce that this was effective immediately. What she said was that we were going to work on a transition plan, that it may take us six to nine months to get there. So what we're asking is that you all give us the time 
to go in and to be able to determine what the right decisions are for this city so that we can get this thing fully vetted and everyone has every question answered. We, your, your questions are very valid and they are, and they are things that we are actively looking at. Thank you. That concludes our last question uh, for Director Lomax O'Neill. Vice Chair Gilmore has, you have one for, okay. Vice Chair Gilmore has, has one last question. Actually, thank you. You're on now. Okay, thank you. Actually, I had uh, two, qu two quick questions. I wanted to know, does it require any legislation to move towards an outpatient care? Be, that would be a question for. Yeah, I still have two more legal. questions. Uh, that would depend on whether the lease agreement with Meharry would need amending. Um, if that's the case, then there there may be some legislative action. Um, obviously, the the funding model and and structure would require council approval. Okay, and then another question I had too is, in terms of the hospital authority, the board, and the mayor's office. I'm not clear about who makes the decision. As a, what, what role does the board play in here? I thought the board had some authority. Could somebody just explain to me how that works in terms of if it go, goes to another model? Is that something that the mayor can do without the hospital authority? Or No, the, the, the hospital authority has the responsibility under state law for operating the hospital. And so any decisions going forward will involve the hospital authority. Okay, so was the hospital authority notified about this outpatient? Did they participate in this? I can't answer that directly. Um, I was not involved. Could Director Lomax do? Uh, neither was I. Okay, so maybe we can get that answer. And then the next one is, I wanted to know, where is the indigent care coming from? We're saying that there's gonna be one. Have we identified how that looks and where that comes from? Uh, no, we have not. Uh, if you wanna think about it this way, um, Think about uh, General's Hospital's um, average daily census. Might be a good way to think about it where they're running um, uh, an average daily census, I think somewhere about 40. I'm just gonna say plus or minus. It's, it's you get highs and you get lows. We want to make sure that those patients uh, have um, services. Okay, I'm still not clear what, I missed that. Could you maybe say it for me in another way, how the, how the fund works? Well, we have not decided exactly how that fund works. It gets back to council, Councilman Leonardo's question. There, there are lots of questions around just, I'll just use one example. What rate do you use? The, the rate that you use determines almost everything in terms of process, in terms of reimbursement rates, in terms of how much coverage you can have, how many people you can serve, and, and all of that. So uh, it would be really premature to anticipate what that looks like today. Okay, and then I have one, this is the, the final question, and, and that's, if some of them can be answered today, I would like some answers on it. So we talked about a stakeholders. So I'm not clear about what role the stakeholders would play when we have a hospital board authority and how that looks. So if you could explain well, how, are we creating a whole not, new body? No, or? we are not creating an, a whole new body. Okay. But I think that the hospital authority board would agree that uh, as we move forward that we need to hear from as many people as we can hear from before final decisions are made. Okay. And that there should, should be no individual um, body or board or uh, elected official or whatever that does that unilaterally. Okay. I think so, but we didn't know if they were notified about the decision to do the outpatient, but we're saying that they should be willing to work with stakeholders that haven't been identified. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Director. Thank you. We'll now have uh, Dr. Webb, uh, Bruce Namor, and I believe Don Alexander. We'll take all three of you at the same time um, up here. You want to get this picture?
and thank you for being so patient. We're running a little behind, so we're gonna be as expedient and as efficient as we can while still delivering uh, the most information that we have to the, to the audience. Not an extra chair down there. Oh no, she just did this set up. Mm -hmm. Must. Come up here. If y'all come up here. Come on. Put up on the screen. Just for the view and audience, go ahead. Go ahead and provide your name and title and your organization affiliation. All right, I'm Joe Webb, the uh, Chief Executive Officer at Nashville General Hospital. Bruce Nearmore, CFO at the hospital. Dawn Alexander, Chief Nursing Officer. Thank you, uh, Council Lady and Chair Lady for uh, having us here today. And I wanna take a quick look at um, and perhaps answer some of the questions that were answered earlier uh, regarding the, uh, the hospital and the uh, activities that we provide. First of all, that's my advancer, is that over there? My monitor is not, apparently not working here, so. I'm gonna speak directly from the screen here. Um, go back to the first screen. The integrated delivery system is very critical that we understand that, and this is for the underserved population, and it speaks to uh, coordinated care patients. So you've heard about the, uh, the funds that have been given to General over the, uh, since 2005. Since 2005, uh, we have contributed just under uh, $1 billion uh, to uh, uncompensated costs uh, to the underserved in Nashville. Charity patients, self-pay patients, forensic patients, you see the numbers uh, to the right of the screen there that totals uh, almost that $1 billion. And so here are the dollars at risk. This was being discussed earlier. Uh, the state supplemental pool is $15.9 million. That's a pool that's shared across the three safety net hospitals that you heard mentioned earlier, Erlanger, uh, Region 1, and uh, Nashville General. There's also a disproportionate share of federal fund of 1.9 million and essential hospital access pool, which is state and federal, 2.3 million. Now the hospital net revenue collections, that is what we collect uh, annually uh, through our own collections process and revenue cycle management process, and that's at $44 million. And then it was stated 54 million state dollars at risk. That number is actually 36 million. Uh, 54 was the uh, was a recent year, uh, but we uh, contacted THA and, and had that recalculated. So it looks like it's 36 million that will not come to the state of Tennessee. Uh, everything else you see there goes directly to the hospital minus the 36 million. So that's a total of uh, 100.1 million dollars that will not, and that's an annual number that will not be used to provide services to the. Uh, the patients, the underserved patients in this community. And so here's a, a quick comparative look at um, how our costs uh, compare to other hospital costs. An emergency room visit, and this is basically looking at that uh, avoidable and unnecessary ER visit, $2,354. Ours is 45% less at $1,295. Now if you look at the average cost of a clinic visit at our hospital, uh, you will see $136. This is where it gets a little tricky uh, because if you don't have a system in place that can transition that population from your emergency room, from your inpatient care, and, and, and utilize that as continuous care or transitional care, then you don't achieve that lower rate. You're basically dealing with higher uh, acuity patients, and so you don't get that rate. I liken it to an assembly line. Uh, if you're looking down an assembly line and you see the finished product, you think, well, it's a nice product, but if you look back up, you'll see where it actually came to be uh, that fine finished product. So our, we don't just get to that by having a fragmented system. That is 
going back to the first page, what the integrated delivery system does for us. And so this is a look at how we care for the population that we serve. And it's, this population is made up of a very complex, medically complex group of individuals. Uh, multiple chronic illnesses, uh, heart disease, congestive heart failure, diabetes, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, and they're, for the most part, uninsured and underinsured, and they have numerous social barriers that prohibit them or prevent them from seeking care throughout the city, uh, and uh, they are comfortable and they are likely to go to, to the places and seek care where they're going to be most comfortable. Uh, and so here's what we've done through our integrated delivery system. We've reduced the unnecessary emergency department visits by 9% over the last year, and we've transitioned those individuals into a lower cost uh, environment. And that's how we are able to transition and keep that cost low. We've improved the blood sugar, or A1C, uh, and blood pressure of those individuals. And we've also reduced the hospital readmission rate. And uh, here's a crosswalk look at how Nashville General versus an ambulatory center uh, would function. Uh, you look to the far left, you see care coordination. It's a medically complex population that we're dealing with. In an ambulatory center, we could not manage that complex of a population. We'd basically be dealing with more stable population. Under patient outcomes, we're talking about measurable and centralized quality outcomes versus if patients are scattered throughout the city seeking care in different hospitals, that becomes fragmented. Uh, access is 24-7 uh, and to uh, the hospital and in a clinic, it would be very limited hours of operations. Uh, an indigent fund, when you talk about an indigent fund, which hasn't been identified what that amount would be, but we have a charity policy in place that tracks and monitors uh, who is going to receive care uh, on a charity basis. And otherwise, that would have to be created in an ambulatory system. So that administrative system would have to be set up. Uh, state and federal funds that are available, you saw that in the earlier slide, uh, under the uh, hospital designated um, safety net designation. Uh, in a clinic, you would not have any of that. Uh, and cost per capita per patient is going to be managed in the hospital versus limited management when you have patients throughout the city that you're trying to manage. So in conclusion, this is the partnership structure that we seek to achieve, uh, and we have been working towards this. Uh, and this is going to be required for success of the hospital. We need to continue to work with our safety net consortium, which is a group of hospitals, uh, clinics, uh, and other safety net providers across the community that we have a relationship with, and we will continue to work with them collaboratively, uh, engage our key stakeholders in the community, all of our key stakeholders, both public as well as private, and an expanded provider based model, which means extending our physician base to grow the volume uh, similar to what it was in years gone past. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Councilman Leonardo. Thank you, Vice Chair. I'd like to thank everyone for being here. Thank you, Dr. Webb. Um, you know, obviously, I don't believe that necessarily the ER is such an issue because you can go into any hospital and they have to serve you when you come through the ER, but we're talking about the continuation of care. And uh, there's a lot of the hospitals and, and they're for profit and they, you know, kind of in a different and have a different business model. Uh, but uh, could you speak to, you know, you heard Councilman Bedney talking about cancer. If you have cancer, if you need a double mastectomy, these are the kinds of things that you just can't walk into a hospital and achieve. And so uh, would there be a fragmentation of care without general? And if so, what does that look like? I think you've heard some of the uh testimony in the past uh, from some of our cancer care patients. Uh, we have a number of survivors out there who sought care in other systems and were not able to achieve it or acquire it. Uh, they presented at general and, you know, one of the things that help us is as a safety net hospital, we have a designation called 340B, which allows us to purchase the infusion and medications uh, that's required to take care of cancer patients. So we're able to get their medications to them at a, at a reasonable rate. Uh, because of that designation, by the way, that designation would go away if the 340, if the uh, safety net hospital did not exist. But we don't turn uh, anyone away. Uh, we have a way we care for them, uh, whether it's cancer or some other form of illness. And uh, finally, 
you'll hear some say that the, the business model uh, of hospitals has kind of shifted to an ambulatory sort of model uh, and that maybe uh, Metro General is not where they need to be in their business models. What's your response to those folks? Well, uh, and that's what I was speaking to earlier. To have an integrated model, you've got to be able to stabilize those patients when they get into crisis. When you have the high incidence or the high prevalence of, of disease in your community, like diabetes, chronic care, and by the way, Tennessee is, is ranked 45th in health outcomes, and uh, Nashville is ranked uh, 45th or 46th as far as, far as uh, 50 other major metropolitan cities and its health outcomes, and that's at the bottom. Uh, so we have a lot of disease in our community, and when you have that, you're gonna see a lot of crisis, and they'll end up in emergency rooms uh, seeking care and treatment. That's what takes the cost up, and it makes it very difficult to manage across you know, six or seven different hospitals when uh, the, the, uh, the difference is that they could present at the general hospital and then we're able to manage them across that transition from inpatient uh, to our medical home model. So if you create a standalone, then you're dealing with fragmented uh, care. And that's what we're trying to avoid here because this population is very difficult to manage. Anyone will tell you they are not easy to manage because they're not accustomed to that level of managed. And when they learn about their disease, which is what we do, in our, our diabetes education classes, our hypertension classes, our smoking cessation classes, we engage them in their own care. So our cost is gonna be less because they are cared for in that, uh, in that, in that uh, environment. But if you eliminate, again, the ability to stabilize them and to capture them at the ER level, then you've destroyed the, uh, the whole system and it doesn't work. Thank you, Councilman. Council Lady Weiner. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. I only have two questions. What are the annual admissions, patient, inpatient admissions? It's about 3,400 um, in this past year. Is that up or down as compared to previous years? That's down. I'm sorry. That's down from prior year by about six or seven percent. That's not um, uncommon in the hospital business. Inpatient business is declining pretty much across the country, and we're no different at Nashville General. A lot of that business is transitioning to outpatient care, whether it's oncology, cardiology. What are the national averages? Uh, you know, I worked, I'll just say, I worked for Humana for the seven years before this, and um, it's inpatient for, and I'm Medicare in particular, Medicare inpatient admission rates have been declining about 3% a year for probably seven or eight years now. Um, and that's for a lot of reasons. A lot of patients that have accessed um, <coughs> HMOs, you know, the, the for-profit HMOs out there, whether it's United or Humana, and they have active management nurses that actually do what, just what Dr. Webb's talking about, that engage those members in taking care of their own um, conditions educating and getting them involved and that's been a large part of it and in, in, in the for-profit healthcare business that's uh, and I'm talking the insurance business that's exactly how you save money and make money going forward and produce a better product we're doing the same thing in a hospital model so it, it is a little different okay. so what we've done is we've reduced the amount of, of uh, readmissions you heard me say that so you won't see quite as many admissions because People are not bouncing back as fast because we're taking care of them better. Uh, and we also are uh, reducing the number of emergency room visits because we're capturing them in an environment where they can be cared for. So, and the length of stay of patients, which will inflate your senses. So when you hear this notion that uh, 40 patients uh, on a daily basis, uh, it's actually more like 51 or 52. But when you hear that, uh, you have to think in terms of when you're reducing your length of stay because the patients don't need to be there as long as they have been, you're also reducing costs. Why would you want a hospital full of patients who cannot afford to pay? Uh, so what you want is a reduced census, but you want the population cared for in the right way so that it doesn't cost you uh, as much. Okay, so of the 3,400 admissions that you've had, 
do you have a, f a sense of what percentage of those were in the OB department, mother-baby couplets? I'm, I'm looking at our CNO. I would say it's um, probably 360 deliveries. Mm -hmm. um, so about a little more than 10% of those would have been OB deliveries. Okay. And then my last question, Dr. Webb, have y'all looked at the impact or the potential projected impact of the agreement between Meharry and HCA insofar as potential inpatient admissions since the students are going to be training elsewhere with their instructors who happen to be physicians with admitting privileges at general? We have, uh, we have looked at that. We have considered that. Um, since we don't know exactly the scope and the full extent of that uh, partnership at this point, we can't uh, make final decisions, but generally speaking, we know that we need a larger base of providers. And so what we're starting to do is to look at where those opportunities might exist among the current uh, providers in the city, whether it's with uh, St. Thomas or with Vanderbilt or some of the other systems uh, where we might be able to work collaboratively in expanding our provider base. Uh, the only way you, you grow volume in a hospital is through providers. If you have a small number of providers, you're likely to have a small census. Uh, so that's the equation that you have to work with. Okay, so last question. Um, when Grady Hospital in Atlanta was in crisis mode and all of the hospitals in the community came together and worked to prop it up and to make it the thriving facility it is now, and I know that you guys went to Grady to actually visit with them and see that. How much of that are you trying to um, incorporate into the future model as you would like to see it? Well, f the first thing we can say about the Grady model is that they exercised an expanded stakeholder. I mentioned that in my earlier slide. Um, also, um, you know, Grady has a partnership or a collaborative relationship with Morehouse College Medical School as well as Emory. So they have a, a larger base of providers that they work with. Um, you know, it would not be uh, unusual for General to have more than one uh, teaching program or, or institution inside with providers. That would actually be preferable and uh, we would see a better base uh, and, and better offset of the, uh, the subsidy you know, cost that we're, we're seeing coming from the city. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Council Lady. Councilman Davis. Council Lady Wiener, um, thank you for your questions. You've answered a couple of mine, but I want to expand on, um, and Dr. Webb, um, if you have, you know, you know, I don't mean to, you know, keep repeating myself, but have you reached out and to Vanderbilt about expanding their teaching, their their programs, you know, just like how Meharry has their their um, intern and their um, residency programs there in general, expanding on this, adding in different providers, just like what happened at, at Grady Hospital? Just some preliminary conversation, nothing extensive. We, we need to see, you know, how this is all going to play out, uh, you know, get a better feel for what the scope of Meharry's relationship is with uh, HCA. So it's not something that we're not going to want to do, uh, as well as um, uh, UT and St. Thomas, you know, to, uh, to explore that. Well, but, but we do know that we're going to need to have more uh, players at the table if we're going to have a viable population in the hospital. Because what you see in the census does not indicate the full scope of the need of the safety net uh, community. Gotcha. And also reaching out to other nursing programs, because there's several universities here in, in just Davidson County alone and Middle Tennessee, if you include other areas, there are several nursing programs. Um, and any assistance needed, because once again, like Council Lady Wiener just said, you know, to save Grady Hospital, and we're supposed to be the healthcare capital of the South and maybe even the world right now, when we came, came in and reach out and do the same thing here that they did in Atlanta. And so if you need any assistance on our end, you know, we're willing to help. And Mr. Jameson, um, I don't know legally what we can do. Okay, but I'm sure, I know that we provide certain things or 
to um, to Vanderbilt University or other medical schools. Um, I don't know if legally can we engage in that conversation. There's All right, thank you, sir. Is that a recommendation? Yes. Okay. Council Lady Hart. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so how many beds do you all have? Interesting question. We, we've seen that uh, in, the, uh, in the media that we have, uh, we're licensed for 150 beds and we operate 120 or 114, but we only have 40 patients. The, the truth is that we staff our, our hospital based on the census, the current census. If it's 40 patients, then we staff uh, for 40 patients. We okay. have a very robust productivity system that allows us to do that. Okay, because I, I was concerned that you had a lot of staff of, you know, just standing around or sitting around or something without having the volume of patients there to serve. These, these two would not allow that to happen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady Hurt. This is the last question. Council Lady Mina Johnson. I got you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will be quick. Uh, thank you, Dr. Webb. Uh, if I heard your uh, presentation right, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but successful integrated care model is fewer inpatient. And to have successful integrated care, having inpatient care hospital is a critical part. Is that correct? Well, um, it, that's a little bit off the, off the path with it. Um, it's um, integrated care just refers to a lack of fragmented care. It's the opposite of fragmented care. So when you integrate, you integrate the different levels. And we were talking about the inpatient, the emergency department, and the outpatient. When you combine those levels, then you're integrating the care. Uh, when you segment that care and lop off a piece of it, like the inpatient and the emergency department, that's when you fragment the care because you lose your patients into disparate systems. And it's very difficult to bring them back to manage the care in a cut continuous uh, manner. So uh, just one of the features in healthcare these days, any hospital across the country is making an attempt to reduce their length of stay of their patients. So when you do that, then you tend to lower your overall census. You have an artificially inflated census when you have long lengths of stay and that just drives up your cost and it reduces your quality. When it's time to go home from a hospital, the worst place you can be is in a hospital. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Council Lady Gilmore. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. I actually have a question for uh, the Mayor's office. I was at the, um, and it, it ties directly to um, Doc, Dr. Webb, but he wouldn't be able to answer the, uh, the question. I was at the board meeting uh, last Friday, full disclosure, where there were hundreds and hundreds of people there. So my, questions, uh, my question is actually to the mayor's office, and I think it's a very important question uh, because I did not hear it earlier. What is the timeline? People are very anxious that work at the hospital. And I think in all fairness to them, they need some type of timeline to explain to them what is going on. And that was shared by the employees. And I just think out of fairness uh, to the employees and respect, they need some type of timeline as it relates to something, which we did not get today. Um, I will try and answer that. I'm not in the mayor's office, but um, the mayor has asked the hospital authority to provide the mayor and finance department with a number, a dollar amount for a supplemental appropriation that will maintain the status quo for the remainder of the fiscal year until June 30th. So um, they are in the process of compiling that information and then once that request is made, the mayor will be coming to the council um, 
with a supplemental appropriation request of some sort. Okay, and, and I just want to do a follow-up question. So we understand it's until the fiscal year, but into all, I think also in all fairness, it's my understanding that the HCA had already sent, because the statement, I think this is what we look, we're looking at, and we have to really be transparent here, because now it's really do or die. The statement was made, and there was not really anything put in place, and so at this point, this is what was shared by the employees that they have began to receive letters from HCA. And at that point, the board did not have any information, the council did not have any information, and the hospital itself did not have any information except, except for the announcement that was made. So do we feel comfortable just leaving it like it is and just saying when the board gets back to us, even though they, they did not receive that information, that we will provide some update? Or, I mean, just where does the, I think we have to be, it's, it's December, we have to be transparent and a follow-up, and, and I'm just really not clear about that. I understand the part about the fiscal um, running to the, to, to the year end, but what happens until then? There's been announcement that's been made, and it's still some information that's hanging out there, and I, I'm, I'm still not clear after today's meeting what's, what's going on. I, I, so your question is what is going to happen between now and, and June 30th? Yes, between all the, the different things right, that's well, going on. And yeah, and will we have a follow-up? Yes, yeah, so I mean, what the Director of Finance said is that there will be um, stakeholder involvement going forward in what the transition and the new plan looks like. Okay. So yes, there will uh, but there how will does be bringing that, something that, back. I mean, because announcements have been made. Is that in two weeks? Is that in a month? So that people can, can, I mean, just have more clarity. At this point, if someone were to ask me something about today's update, of the meeting, I still would be able to tell them, we're looking at outpatient, we don't have a study done, we don't know how the indigent fund looks, but we'll run it until the end of June. And I just think we should be, there's been, there's been a recommendation that's been made, and I just think in all fairness, we need, as, as a council body, we're entitled to have, we, we don't have a, the study that supports, we just, I mean, in all fairness, I think we deserve that. And the people, the employees of uh, Metro General, the board deserves that, and so does the CEO. And we, we do not have, there's a stakeholders meeting, but we don't know when that'll happen. So I, I think that we, d we deserve that in a, in a, recent, a reasonable time frame. <coughs> what does that look like? I cannot give you a, a definitive date on when all of the, we, they will have all of the answers, but um, uh, we will be back with you quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Councilman Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to, to actually just say this. I take it as a total area of disrespect right now on the administration and whoever else to come in here with such a pivotal decision that we have to make and put it and have such vagueness and not necessarily answer our question. My family utilizes this hospital. My mother had had no insurance, had been saved by some of the things that, that go on. This bothers me. And for our administration and this place to come in here with such a, a notion of just saying we may, we may, we may, we may, or we're meeting and who the people that you are going to bring to this table, it's such an area of disrespect on this body who runs this city. I, I, I would tell the mayor and every representative that is here because it, it is affecting my family. It's affecting people that, that are here. And evidently, for those of you that are in such a supportive stance of being able to move this into a place that is not going to be beneficial for the residents, and my district is heavily represented by the majority of African Americans in this community. We already know that most of the African Americans in the city have been utilizing this hospital. But not only them, I, I've heard other constituents who have said the same dang thing. We can't do this to our residents. We can't do this to the people that, that voted us into office. And God dog it, we're gonna do everything that we can to fight and make sure that we are represented. And I already know if the system goes down like this, there will be a lot of people that will not return either to run the city or to sit in the chair that I'm in right now. 
And my job is to fight because the people elected me to be right here. And I'm speaking for them. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Hastings. Um, as chair, this will be the last question and I will invoke my privilege. Uh, Dr. Webb, um, I wanna get back to the, to the fiscal uh, side of this. Um, that's my charge as chair of budget and finance. With Meharry moving, uh, with their partnership with HCA, they will no longer be utilized in general as a teaching hospital. Is that, what does that cost look like? Is that, is that less money or, or do you project needing the same subsidy? What is, what is that anticipated cost? Well, having the experience of, of uh, serving in the CEO role of teaching as well as non-teaching hospital, uh, in comparison, I can say that it's less expensive to operate a non-teaching hospital because there are certain services that you don't have to provide if they're not uh, producing the volume or a return on the investment that you're putting into it. Now, knowing that this is a safety net hospital, we know that there's a certain scope of services that we do want to provide. But unless we're dealing with a true loss leader, uh, you know, there are some services within the scope that we provide now that we would not necessarily need to provide as a non-teaching hospital. So. Uh, once we know the full scope of what, uh, what's going to take place and we can start make some better decisions uh, about how we can start to streamline some additional costs there at the hospital, there has already been a lot done uh, in, in, in general with just general reductions and efficiencies. But from a scope of service standpoint, we can be more um, aggressive there as well once we get a better feel. Thank you so much. This is going to conclude our, uh, our joint <laughs> budget and finance, health hospitals and social services committee meeting. I'd like to thank uh, Vice Chair uh, uh, Gilmore. I would like to thank our committee members and the council members um, that came to receive this information. I know there's still a lot of questions that's unanswered, um, but we're, we're going we're gonna to move forward with this. We're going to continue uh, to seek out answers. We're going to continue um, to work with our community stakeholders um, because we are ultimately accountable to them. This is a, a very serious matter. I want to thank SEIU uh, for coming. Thank uh, Sheriff Darren Hall, Representative Love, uh, Representative uh, Jernigan also for coming and providing uh, their, their, um, their perspective as it relates to the state impact of this too, and also uh, for Dr. Webb and staff. This is gonna conclude our meeting. Uh, go ahead. I just wanna express thanks to our board and our board chair, Dr. Brandis, who is right over here to my right for your support, and we are hopeful that as we engage stakeholders that they will certainly be a part of that. Thank you so much. We'll adjourn this meet committee meeting, and then we'll transition into our budget and finance committee meeting.